Hello there, economists. This is Jeff Beckstrom coming to you with some basics on uh, AP Microeconomics Unit 5 Factor Markets, or the Market for Productive Resources. Before we get started today, I'd like to give a quick credit to uh, Mr. Jacob Clifford for the uh, original slide source material. Um, so thank you to Mr. Clifford, and let's get right down to it. Okay, so... Uh, the main difference in Unit 5, the uh, market for productive resources, is who goes where uh, according to the supply and demand model. Right? So the first thing we're going to take a look at is perfect competition. There's one other uh, resource market model that we'll take a look at a little bit later in the unit, but let's start with perfect competition because it's fairly straightforward. In a perfectly competitive labor market, we see many small firms all hiring workers and uh, no one firm being large enough then to manipulate the market and pay the workers a lower than market wage. Um, many workers have identical skills. So uh, any one worker is not necessarily any better than any one other worker in this market. And this is typically best used to describe a kind of minimum wage or low wage uh, labor market. The wage is constant or set by the market. So if market conditions change, the wage, is, wage changes. But again, no worker or no firm uh, is able to exert any control over this wage. It is only the market forces that change the wage in a perfectly competitive labor market. One other thing I should mention before we get any further is that um, this, uh, these same models can apply to the market for any productive resource, though labor is typically speaking the most important productive resource. It's the biggest part of a firm's um, expenditure for the most part for most firms. Um, and so we will come back again and again to labor and specifically in perfect competition, uh, the low skill or minimum wage labor market as our prime example. Um, so both workers and firms actually are wage takers. And firms can hire as many workers as they want if they are willing to pay the market wage. Workers can work as many hours as they want if they're willing to accept the market wage. So first of all, um, the one big shift in thinking that you need to make for unit five is who makes up the demand curve and who makes up the supply curve. So um, in previous units, one through four, we thought mostly about firms as suppliers, suppliers in the product market. Um, in the resource market or factor markets, firms are on the demand side. So firms demand labor and then they take that labor along with other productive resources and turn it into products to sell in the product market. Uh, the demand for labor shows the quantities of workers that firms will hire at different wage rates, and the demand curve looks just like you might expect. As wage falls, the quantity demanded increases. So when firms can pay a lower wage, they'll hire more labor. When they have to pay a higher wage, they'll hire less labor. And then likewise, individuals or uh, households would be another way to think of it, um, are the people or the entities that supply labor in the uh, market for productive resources. Um, the supply of labor is the number of workers who are willing to uh, and able to work at different wage rates. And just as you might expect, just as in the uh, product market, the supply curve is upward sloping. So if you think about yourself, you know, what would what wage would it take for you to leave school and go work? Uh, certainly not minimum wage. But, you know, if I offered you five hundred dollars an hour to go become an economist right now, you'd probably say, you know, to heck with my high school diploma or college degree. I'm going to take that job. So um, the higher the wage, the more willing and able people would be to join that industry or uh, offer their time to work in that industry. And there's some kind of interesting uh, nuances to that idea to come a little bit later in the unit. So the equilibrium then is uh, just like, say, for this example with carpenters, where supply and demand meet. So the equilibrium wage for carpentry might be $30 an hour, which is about where it is in uh, my area right now. There it is. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first of the three main new pieces of vocabulary for the beginning of Unit 5, the first one is derived demand. Um, derived demand just refers to the demand for factors of production. And the demand for factors of production comes from what they can produce. So, for example, here, there's a, a pizza restaurant. So if there is an increase in demand for pizza, you might expect demand for cheese to increase, demand for cows to make that cheese, and milking machines to extract the milk from the cows to make the cheese, and veterinarians to take care of the cows so they can be hooked up to the machines so that they can have the milk extracted, so that they can make it, etc., etc., etc. You get the picture. Um, 
Um, something that's going on in the world right now, if you're watching this video right now, is the COVID-19 lockdown pandemic worldwide. Um, and you've probably seen news stories about the need for things like uh, gloves and masks and ventilators. Um, so the increase, the huge increase in demand for health care with, for people with COVID-19, as well as other health care issues, has put an, an enormous explosion of uh, resource demand on those uh, products that I just mentioned, that all are kind of intermediate products that go into providing health care. So derived demand is the demand for resources which is determined or derived by the products that they help produce. Um, next we're going to talk about the labor supply to the firm. So firms decide how much labor to hire from the labor pool based upon uh, labor's marginal cost or how much do they have to pay to hire the next worker. Um, this additional cost for each additional worker is known as the marginal resource cost. So this is very similar in concept to marginal cost in the product market, except now we stick a resource in the middle, so it's marginal resource cost. Um, sometimes you'll also see textbooks or other lessons refer to this as marginal factor cost or MFC. Um, as we previously discussed, marginal resource cost for a firm in a perfectly competitive market should be perfectly elastic. So the firm can hire as many workers as it wants at the wage rate. If it tries to pay any lower than the wage rate, then um, they won't be able to hire any workers. If it uh, wants to pay above the wage rate, it could, but there's no reason to do so. Um, so if a worker wants to work, they must offer their service at the wage set by the market. Otherwise, they're not going to find that job. Um, and marginal resource cost then is constant, as, uh, as I just explained. So if you want to write down a formula for calculating marginal resource cost, um, it's the change in total cost divided by the change in inputs. Um, let's see, let's talk about firm's labor demand before we put these two things together. So I'll take a, you can pause for a moment to write that stuff down. On we go to firm's labor demand. So a firm's demand for workers depends upon how profitable each worker is. So if the marginal resource cost is set by the market, um, the profitability of each worker depends upon the organization of the firm and what they're trying to make and so on and so on and so on. One thing that we know though about all firms across all industries in the short run is that they will experience the law of diminishing marginal returns. So um, you can expect each additional worker to generate fewer and fewer units of output. And so marginal revenue product, which is what we're going to get to with this, will end up falling. So if a worker generates five additional units of output, which can be sold for $10 each, how much uh, is that worker worth to the firm? 50 bucks. So the firm should be willing and able to pay a wage of up to 50 bucks. But as I was just starting to explain ahead, um, we would expect that $50 to fall as additional workers are hired because of the law of diminishing marginal returns. Um, so this is what we'll refer to as marginal revenue product. Um, again, very similar to marginal revenue from our work in the product market units, um, but now we stick a product on the end because um, it's uh, a factor of production that's producing a product. This is also sometimes called the uh, the value of the marginal product of labor. So VMLP is what it's referred to in some textbooks as. Uh, all right, so the additional revenue generated by hiring an additional worker or employing an additional unit of a factor of production or resource in a perfectly competitive market, um, the marginal revenue product equals the marginal product of the resource times the price of the product. So if the price of the product in a perfectly competitive product market, which by the way is typically the way a question around this topic is set up by the college board on the AP exam. Um, so if the product price is constant, then we multiply the productivity of the most recent worker by the product price to find that most recent worker's marginal revenue product. So if the marginal product of a third worker is five units and the price of the good is constant at 20 bucks, the marginal revenue product is $100. <laughs> um, so another way to calculate marginal revenue product is the change in total revenue divided by the change in inputs. And again, you're going to want to look out for this. Oftentimes, you will see the cho change in total inputs as a 1. So 
um, you can get fooled into like not dividing by the change in total inputs. But you might have a problem that says, well, if a firm went from two workers to four workers and their total revenue changed by you know five hundred dollars, then you would need to end up dividing that five hundred by two to find the marginal revenue product for each of those two workers. All right, so have you guessed it? Higher workers up until marginal revenue product equals marginal resource cost. So uh, very, very similar to the previous profit maximizing rule of um, MC equals MR, um, but now it's MRP equals MRC. And graphically, it's going to look like this. The marginal resource cost is a flat level supply of labor curve set by the market and the demand for labor or marginal revenue product falls as more workers are hired and that's because each additional worker is less and less productive than the previous due to the law of diminishing marginal returns and so we have our full-on perfectly competitive labor market graph that looks just like this let me get my face out of the way sorry about that um, here's our side-by-side -side graph showing the market and the firm. Always put the industry on the left and the firm on the right. Um, a couple of things to point out. It's labeled, 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 labeled. All curves are labeled. This is a regular old supply and demand curve. The, it's a little bit curvy, but you can make them straight lines. That's fine. And then again, this important dashed line showing the connection that the firm is a wage taker from the market. I have a couple of guided practice examples for you to work through right now. I'll display the example. You can pause the video to take time to look through the answers. So if you hire workers to mow lawns, then the wage for each worker is set at $100 a day. And each lawn that is mowed by your firm earns you 50 bucks. Let's see, you can hire one worker and that worker can mow four lawns per day. If you hire a second worker, together they can mow five lawns per day. So what's the marginal resource cost for each worker? It's first worker's marginal revenue product, second worker's marginal revenue product. Are you going to hire both of them? Yes or no? Now's where you would stop it. And to go over the answers, the marginal resource cost for each worker is $100. The first worker's MRP is 200. The second worker's MRP is only 50. You're only going to hire the first worker because if you hire the second worker, that worker costs you 100, but only brings in 50. Right, so that's a no uh, on our marginal analysis. That's where we stop, stop with one worker. Um, for number seven, what must actually happen to the wage uh, for you to hire that second worker? Um, either the wage needs to fall to 50 or you need to be able to earn um, over $100 or $100 or more uh, for mowing each lawn. Okay, here's another example. Um, if you own a business and you're selling the goods in a perfectly competitive product market, so the price is the constant $10, and you're hiring workers from a perfectly competitive resource market and the wage is a constant $20, um, assume wage is the only cost and take a look at this data and maximize profits. How many workers are you going to hire? Pause it now. And I'll go through the answers. So our units of labor and our total product. So each worker um, is worth the value that they add. So we have our marginal productivity. Remember, marginal productivity is the difference between um, what's created by one worker and the next. And we can take that marginal productivity data and turn it into our marginal revenue product by multiplying by the product price. So our marginal revenue product looks like that how much each worker is worth to the firm. Our marginal resource cost, as we know, is $20 all the way down. The firm's a wage taker. So at what point should we stop hiring workers? Should we hire the first worker? Well, we get 70 and it costs us 20. So that's a yes, a yes, a yes, a yes, a yes. When they're equal, you do hire that worker, but you are not going to hire the sixth worker because the sixth worker only brings in 10, but costs you 20. So you should hire five workers. Uh, remember to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this intro video to Unit 5 Factor Markets. Look out for my next video, which will uh, follow up on market power and other uh, elements of uh, factor markets. Thank you.